Buongiorno, I'm Frances Mays. I'm going to read a little bit from Always Italy, my new book. I wrote it with Ondine Cohane, and she is also going to be reading. Hi, I'm Ondine Cohane, the co-author of Always Italy with Frances Mays and published by National Geographic. At first, we were disappointed by the timing of when this book was coming out. But now we realize it's an opportunity to show solidarity with Italy, all of the beautiful things here, like the museums, the restaurants, the hotels, the producers, a time to show how much we care about this country. This is from the introduction. The journeys I took for this book were exhilarating because finally I could stop at Greek ruins in Calabria, order the rustic pastas of Sardinia, stand under waterfalls in Trentino Alto Adige, watch water buffalo milk transform into mozzarella in Puglia, and hike the sublime trails of the Dolomites. I scoured the sites in all 20 regions. At last, I thought, I am beginning to know this country. Still, much remains for as many future trips as I can plan. What a grand quest. My sense of adventure doubled, multiplied. Lost in time villages of the Abruzzo and Molise. Peak dining experiences in Emilia Romagna. The joyous Sicilian Baroque that seems to have whipped cream as one of its building materials. Le Marques turquoise waters and beaches which look to my southern eyes like white grits. Those eagle nest mountain retreats around Bolzano and Murano for curative mineral waters and robust mountain food. I especially like the little castle strongholds in Piedmont with undulated vineyards as neat as rows of knitting. Getting to know the North was a big surprise I thought that as I began to hear German and the terrain changed, that Austria and Switzerland would seem too near, some Italianists would erode. Not so. The cultural mix near the borders was instead stimulating. A glorious, too, discovering each region's food traditions, vastly different, passionately maintained. I'm sure you can find a bad meal in Italy. But where? Where might that be? Even freeway auto grills serve tempting panini and often feature gelato, cafeterias with pasta, grilled meat, and fresh vegetables. At the gas station? How is that possible? The simple answer is Italians won't put up with bad food. My idea of heaven is to walk into a town around noon on Sunday and locate, usually by aromas drifting from the doorway, where the locals will be having their pranzo, their Sunday lunch, on this Bona Dominica. I followed several food quests, especially cheese and wine, wanting to try everything. It was fun seeing how the all-important bread varies from the unsalted, hard-crusted loaves of Tuscany to Puglia's cake-like rounds weighing in at around six pounds. And then on to Liguria's tender focaccia and Sardinia's savory flatbreads, all taste of the place itself. Amid so much beauty and humanism, you feel confirmed. The glittering otherworldly Orvieto Cathedral Majestic Marcus Aurelius on horseback in Roma's Piazza del Campidoglio. The frescoed Palazzi of Trento look like medieval board games. Not a thing apart. Art exists as naturally as air. I wanted to transport you to the eternal city, to Rome, through film. So I'm going to read an excerpt about film in Rome from the book. Muse, star, backdrop, inspiration, Rome and film. Even if you haven't been to Rome in person, you have most likely seen it in cinematic glory. 
Roman Holiday from 1953 and starring Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck immortalized the city for legions of fans as they zigged through town on a Vespa and ate gelato as they walked down the Spanish steps. The film also has made every visitor since wish that they too had an eternal city pad to live out their Italian escape from reality. In the 1960s, La Dolce Vita brought viewers to the Trevi Fountain and made women everywhere wish they could frolic in the water essentially as Anita Ekberg did in her stunning strapless evening gown. And the talented Mr. Ripley, directed by Anthony Minghella and released in 1999, gave the city a seductive if, if sinister veneer as Matt Damon and Gwyneth Paltrow lingered in gold-lit cafes and palazzi that could double as museums. More recently, in 2013, Paolo Sorrentino's La Grande Bellezza, The Great Beauty, caught the eternal city at its best angles. Despite a plot showcasing a Rome full of decadence and slow decline, the sublime location stunned. The opening scene at Fontana dell'Acqua Paola the visiting nun on her knees climbing the Scala Sancta, the long pans of glowing patinas and lamp-lit streets, as well as visits to secret gardens and noble hideaways, linger for months after their viewing. Of course, Rome, Italy's equivalent of Hollywood, has always been associated with film. It began here in the 1930s at the city's Cina Città, spawning great classics like Vittorio De Sica's 1948 Bicycle Thief, which showed the dark side of a city in a neorealistic -re film that's still considered one of the screen's most important works. Whatever their angle, both Italian and foreign directors have been inspired to bring Rome into the spotlight, a tradition of the silver screen that continues to memorialize the city for the next generation. Travel is always a leap of faith into the unknown, into new worlds. In Italy, 20 of them. Isn't that exciting? Each region remains unique. What's not yet known lies shimmering before you.